Hey guys, welcome back. It's Biggs. Now today, part two of the series in dealing with that situation that recently happened in the U.S. pertaining to the killifish from Brazil, we're going to be talking to an expert today. Now, as I mentioned in the first episode, I'm going to try and open up that discussion and bring in aspects of experts from different fields to be able to really flesh out the full story. And today's not going to be an exception. Today I was very fortunate to be able to sit down with an expert, somebody from the scientific community, to give us the true Brazilian perspective. This is a, a well-known uh, Brazilian scientist named Luiz Tancat, and uh, Luiz is going to give us the perspective from the Brazilian standpoint. Now, I don't think that this issue is necessarily pertaining specifically just to, say, killifish. I think this is we, we should look at this in a much more broad spectrum, all ornamental fish, but even beyond that, I think this pertains to all flora and fauna from originating from Brazil. And maybe you might not like the discussion, you might not like the answers you're going to hear, but honestly, every single country in the world has the rights to place their own rules and regulations in regards to protecting their own resources and uh, Brazil is no exception and I think some of the if you watch the whole video and you listen to the whole interview I think you'll come out with a very very positive outlook on the ways that they're handling this and trying to develop uh, ways and means to protect some of their flora and fauna for future generations so as always my friends thank you kindly for watching let's get into it <music> friend so Luis we're going to talk about this situation here you, you, you have some involvement or some direct know-how know about uh, what what went down but in regards to this uh, the situation that happened with this transnational search warrants pertaining to the Brazil government and uh, the United States Fish and Wildlife uh, uh, on something to do with killifish the way I am seeing these things is that uh, killifish are extremely um, narrowly distributed fish and, and they live in quite um, fragile um, sites. So if you do minor changes in, in, the, in their region, um, those temporary pools and, and these really small streams they live, they will simply disappear. And these are um, quite uh, vulnerable species. So uh, I think and I feel that the guys from the hobby, they have a really strong movement to uh, save and preserve yes. the species. So uh, I think they do this uh, with a very, very good intention. So uh, I think the feeling is basically, well, the, the natural uh, habitats has been destroyed. So if we have them, uh, the species survive this, um, this situation. Uh, the problem is, uh, Good intentions sometimes uh, can be a problem, uh, especially if you uh, people to overfish these populations, these natural populations to export. Uh, we need to remember that we have some rules to follow. And um, I think uh, this kind of, of um, emotional way to do things, it can, can be not good sometimes. And we have to use uh, the reason to think about it. So the best way to save these species is to uh, help to uh, save the sites. Correct. So save the habitat. So uh, we have some groups in Brazil doing this. They are very active and um, they are basically scientists and uh, hobbyists too. Mm -hmm. And they are really working on saving the sites because uh, it, it's really interesting to have um, to have these uh, stocks, but uh, to be honest, if you keep them for a long time, you have uh, a lot of interbreeding and things like that, and yeah. you have the species. Fine. Yeah, it's it's not. This is not really saving the species. It's something more for for your uh, conscious. So, um, so the best way to help is basically uh, getting in touch with the scientists working with the groups. And uh, there is a very strong killifish association in Brazil, which is devoting their lives to uh, protect the species. I can uh, share 
uh, the guys, uh, the links and with you and, and the names of the people working with this. And they can really, they will really be receptive, I, I believe, with, with the hobbyists. This is, this is something um, which I am trying to keep in the past, this kind of fight between scientists and hobbyists. I have a really good relation with people from the hobby. And basically what I think about it is uh, in order to make something uh, which these people believe it's good, and I believe from their hearts this is something good, they are pushing uh, the situation in in a very complicated uh, way. And this is sadly something um, illegal. So yeah, that, that's the most important thing is because reality is, is and maybe in this in, in individual instance of what we're talking about, you know, this case, I'm not saying everybody is doing that illegal. There's hundreds and hundreds, maybe even thousands of species of killifish and all sorts of other tropical fish that are very, very well established in the trades and are farmed all over the world in different aspects and stuff. But bottom line is, is if we want to go and collect new genetic material out of the wild in any country, we have to first be respectful and know one where we're collecting and what the laws of the land are. You know, we yeah. have, have to have those import permits or whatever is the case, right? That's that's just yes. Um, it's and if you part. really, yeah, and if you really want to help uh, these species, you can always make contact with people working with them here, and well maybe pay some visit when things get better <laughs> here. Um, yeah, and you can pay a visit. I received some, uh, some friends from, from the hobby, like Hans Evers, for example. Yep. Uh, he yep. visited me and we, uh, he was um, in some field trips with me uh, for my projects and he photographed everything and saw everything. And I guess this is really positive for both sides. Mm -hmm. And, and you can really, really help. Um, if we get uh, the situation under control, the species will be out of the um, threat category. And after this happening, we can regularly export the fish. So right. this is the best way to get your fish today is to help remove the fish from a threat category. This is what we are uh, really trying to do with the changes. So Brazil is a bit different in the way that they control fisheries or the aspect of export of tropical fish. Uh, I remember, maybe if we talk about that a little bit, because I remember back in the day, it was open. You could take whatever you want. And I remember in the 90s when people really started really going into the Shingu system, late 80s, early 90s, and they were pulling at all these super extremely fancy loricarian plecos, none of which were described, all the different myriad of crenocyclas and pike cichlids and the little telia cichlids. And then, you know, all the other accompanying uh, carisons and little quarries and stuff, stuff that nobody had ever seen before in the trade. I remember it. I was, I, was, I was young then. I remember that. And that was an exciting time. And the zebra pleco was probably the most notable one. And then all of a sudden there was new legislation that came into play years later to control. And it was basically produced a list of only the fish that were on this list could be exported. And that shut yeah. down a massive amount of fish being exported, which people were upset about in the in the hobby, but it was done for a very specific reason. So in the past, we had a positive list. Yeah. So if a species uh, was included in this positive list, it would be okay to export. Uh, it's, uh, well, initially this seems a really good idea, but with time, we figured out that it's not really uh, an intelligent way of doing things. Uh, what we saw in Brazil is the increasing of illegal activity. And the main problem, just to begin with, I must say that we have two kinds of people uh, in, the, in the trade. We have people keeping and breeding fishes. These are the people I really want to get contact and be friends. Yep. But we have also the collectors. Yes. And, and these collectors, they are really the problem here. Um, they want because the rare, they, they, want the, they have the money and they want the rare because they have the only one. Exactly. Yeah. So this is the problem. And about the positive list, it was created and never uh, get an update. So we were in one decade with no updates. So what we, we did with people trying to work legally, we 
placed some options and they could only work with those options. And the problem is when you do this, you need to uh, understand that uh, species in threat categories. Uh, when I say uh, these uh, threat categories, I'm talking about the UCN uh, categories. So uh, basically, if a fish is, was uh, in a threat category or uh, outside the positive list, you, you couldn't export it. The problem is, uh, think about the whole uh, fish fauna from Brazil. It's gigantic. So you need to train people to uh, identify a huge number of species. And a lot of these areas with have this kind of really been explored because there's no you can't just hop in your car and drive to a lot of these areas. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You need to recognize the, the positive list species and the red list species. So it it's a, a huge number. And you must remember that you need to do this just by looking to the fish in a in a bag with water. So for us, uh, generally, we need to kill the fish and put under uh, a stereo microscope and do counts, measures, and everything to, to make a, a very good ID. You must remember also that um, many species are extremely similar to each other. So um, sometimes it's virtually impossible to just look at it and say, it's something or or not something. So the geographical uh, variance because the rivers just the, the rivers one giant river with many rivers attached to it, right? Yeah. So uh, this this was a really big problem, and and basically uh, we forced some people, which were trying to work legally, uh, we forced some kind of situation that they became, without wanting this, became criminals. For example, if uh, the bycatch was really a problem. Uh, we know that some, some person, uh, some people from Brazil were arrested because of bycatch, unintentional bycatch. So you don't want that species, but they came in your net and then you bring it to your um, facility. To yeah. Your, yeah, to your facility. And then, well, you're arrested because of this. So this kind of situation, yeah, this kind of situation is, is really crazy. So what we think about it, we understand that maybe if we just use a negative list, so we can pick the ones. No, these ones cannot go. Yeah. It's a more restricted group. You can train better someone to recognize the species which will receive the no. And also, if a species, even uh, if it's not under a threat category, the changes allows uh, you to ask for uh, the species, even without a uh, threat category, be out of the regular trade. So if you have proof enough um, to show that that kind of species is not uh, suitable for, for the trade, for example, we have species that they are not really uh, in any threat category, but they simply die easily when you capture them. You know these species will not uh, survive the travel. So why you include a lot of them to export only a small number because of the death? Yeah. Maybe cardinals have that sort of, you know, you still lose a percentage of them. Exactly. So uh, this kind of situations led us to propose this change. So other things that we try to change was uh, we want to uh, be able to breed these fishes in Brazil and export the um, the fry. We we know that fishes like the zebra black for example, you can make thousands of them, um, breed them easily, and then you don't need to put some pressure in the natural population. So uh, what we're trying to do is to propose that if you breed them um, in these kind of facilities, you can export a fry. It, it's, there is no, uh, for example, Leandro Souza working with, with the zebra plecos, he's producing thousands of them. And and then you cannot do anything with these because you cannot return them to the natural habitat. Yeah, because it doesn't. And you exist. can also, <laughs> yeah, and you can also export them. So it's uh, it's really nonsense. So Brazil's not um, getting any money out of that fish, which is a hot fish. But yet that fish was exported in massive numbers. So you've got like farms over in like over in like uh, Indonesia. Indonesia yeah. is making money off of Brazilian fish. 
Yeah, and, and I think the most interesting thing about making the negative list is because we do reveals and updates uh, uh, five from five years. Okay. So the book was published in 2018 and we'll publish the new version um, in 2023. So if you compare with the positive list, which stayed the same for ever. around a decade <laughs> ever so it seems i i think it's a it's a better way to to doing this and also we proposed um something to make the um, this undescribed species available for the hobby with some kind of partnership with uh universities and museums so um if someone wants to export a fish, undescribed fish, you can contact a museum or a university, provide material, and we can propose a code for the species. So it's a recognized species, and then we can regularly export this, this species. So um, this is also something uh, really important because we are describing uh, hundreds of species every year, and we need more dynamic, way of dealing with these names. So basically uh, we have, uh, we are uh, working with the analysis of the threat categories uh, every year. For example, the book, which will be published in a couple of, of years from here, we are already working on it. So um, we never stop looking. And this seems really good because uh, when we publish it, it's, uh, it's based on really um, recent and good data. Yes. So we are talking about something that we, a really uh, big group of experts are doing this work together and providing these lists. Uh, do you have any controls in place for like, I'll use the zebra, zebra pleco as an example. I know that the zebra pleco, uh, whether you have a positive or a negative list, there is, still is that, uh, that underground market, that smuggling market of any type of fish. And if it's a fish that's that hot and that much in demand, people are willing to pay for it, smugglers will find a way. Uh, how, how does Brazil try to in, uh, influence any control over fish that are, I'm assuming zebra plecos, they often appear on like the Colombian list. And we know full well, they're not coming from Colombia. And that is a long journey to come all the way from where they're collected all the yeah. way there, or they're, they're being, Maybe they're getting captive bred. I don't know. I don't have any direct information one way or the other. But how does Brazil plan to control that aspect? Is, is, is it just is it too small of a piece of a pie to worry about, or is it something that you, you generally are concerned about? It's something really um, important because the zebra pleco is it, it's a big symbol yes. uh, of the whole thing. So uh, what we try to do is to basically. Uh, as I told you, we had no pretension to solve the problems of animal traffic. It's nearly impossible. But what we try to do is to make the legal trade easier. So uh, I presume at least that if we have a, a way to make the legal trade easy and make people have the fish legally and easily, so we can uh, remove the pressure from these black market because they provide really damaged fish, sick, nearly dead fish. So if we do this correctly, we can export uh, healthy fish Very for a fair price. Our idea is to make the, the legal trade easier. And with this, uh, we can um, provoke people to stop buying with, with, uh, we are trying to reduce the excuses to have fish from the illegal market. Hey, with the zebra pleco, if, if, if you can produce them, Leonardo's producing vast numbers and other people are producing vast numbers. If you had a method that you could export them legally, and if you guys can yeah. do thing with zebra plecos, that money goes back into Brazil and helps build Brazil. Exactly. People wanting to keep uh, fishes, uh, this will never stop. So, what we have to do is to make uh, things right and, and find the 
better way to do it. So the better way to do it is to make people want legal fish in the first place. And for this to happen, we need to provide ways for legal um, workers to export the fish. Mm -hmm. So the best way today I see, and that, that's uh, something I think the killifish uh, community can really do, is what the catfish people is doing now, is to help the scientists to, to better understand and describe the species and to, um, and to make the species the names available and the studies with the populations in natural habitat to, to prove or not if the species is under uh, a threat or not. And if it is under a threat, you can help to, um, to change this kind of situation. So what I want to, to, to do here is to um, instigate people to talk with scientists from these areas. So I know we have a really good group of uh, scientists working with killifish. They also have an organization. What we want to do is to find uh, a midway so we can make everyone happy. And, and we also preserve the species in natural habitat. And this is something I really want to make people from the hobby understand. They have really good intentions, I know, but uh, if we don't preserve natural populations, uh, it really um, means not too much because you, you lose uh, all the, the genetical uh, story uh, of this whole lineage and you have a lot of brothers and sisters in your tank. So, so we need to, to find, I, I think when we push too much, so we say no to everything, we want to, to say, uh, no, this species, no, no, no. You put some kind of target in some species. Some people really want the species with no's. So if you say no, uh, someone will ask for it. I want this one because everyone is saying no. I think that is really the message is us as an aquarist, we have to take responsibility. We are passionate about nature. We're passionate about our aquariums our, and so forth, be it plants, you want a planted tank, you want a fish tank. You're passionate about that, otherwise you wouldn't be doing it. Well, we gotta also extend that passion to appreciating nature. And just because something isn't available, if we're passionate enough, we should be more respectful and understanding of leaving that species where it is actually a better situation than trying to find a way to get it anyways. The whole idea behind the changes uh, was basically make it possible to work legally with fish. And we also want to, um, to make uh, hobbyists understand that buying legal fish is a really, really good way to help. Yes. So if you, if you have options of getting legal fish and legal fish, go for the legal. Support the marine hobbies had that problem for years, right? The, the saltwater side. See, I never, ever kept marine fish when I was younger and working in the trade because to me, it was just constantly taking fish from the wild without any consideration. Back in the 80s and the 90s, there was no consideration of trying to captively breed any of this stuff. And uh, I remember yeah. after that time period, then they started, the, the, the fish stocks were getting less. So then in the Philippines, I believe it was the Philippines, I don't want to be wrong. They started using things like cyanide underwater, like using poisons to catch things. Yeah, How, how sure. can anybody think that that's a good idea? <laughs> yeah. but it's we, had, we had this problem in Peru. In Peru, really? they were using, yeah, poison to get uh, catfish that's because true. they survived. They initially survived, but the damage in, in gills okay. are irreversible. So they will live until they reach you and they, they will die. So you're even losing money and you're supporting something uh, really bad. So this is really something that bothers me. So you have the right option available. You only have gains. You have healthy fish, good healthy fish, and you are supporting someone doing the right thing. So it's really important for us have having the accuracy in your side. So would I be fair this, in saying, um, see on the, arg on the argument from a hobbyist standpoint, not necessarily my standpoint, but a lot of hobbyists would say, well, I'm taking fish out of the environment because Brazil is building these dams, killing environment, mm. and there's gold mining, and there's all these different things that are poisoning environments. Would it be fair to say that, yes, these are things that are happening, but now we have an organization that you're a part of 
that is very actively trying to lobby against your own government about we've got to find better ways, like you mentioned at the beginning, about finding better power sources than the bells, because the dams aren't working the way they intended. Yeah, we need to be careful with this because uh, when you say Brazil is doing something, Brazil is a very big country yes. with a lot of people in it. And most people in, in my country are, are not, um, they don't think this kind of destruction is good, but we know that powerful people in, in powerful positions, they can get um, big money from this kind of um, buildings like dams. And yep. so um, this is really the problem. Uh, if you ask people in the streets, you see that most people really cares about um, um, the natural habitat species and most people understand that we live in this world and we need to care about it because we want to live. Many people don't know the problems with, with the dam, for example, they think it's a good, clean, renewable energy. What we're trying to show now is that it's nothing like it, uh, but as, as soon as they know, they change their minds. So uh, we can only win this uh, with information as always, uh, science and information. Um, but it's, uh, it's really important to say that when people say Brazil is doing something, uh, you need to know. change this for politicians are doing. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> because because uh, <laughs> most people here, they, uh, this is something I really want to, to tell everyone. Um, if you ask people, you see that most of us uh, don't agree with some kind of situation like destroying uh, a river mm -hmm. to, to generate uh, a very small amount of energy, which is not there to generate energy, is there to make some people rich. And then uh, what I really think it's important here is that if we don't work together, it would be really hard to change the situation. So you, on the other side, must uh, pressure, put some pressure in the, the guys you're buying fish. I ask you for patience. Um, and nothing, none of these things are going to happen fast. <laughs> we are, yeah, we are trying to change this reality. And I think the changes in law was the first step towards the situation. There is no other place in the world with more species than Brazil regarding fish. Yep. Very I don't think... I don't think there is another place in the world like us uh, regarding this. It's, it's really important to say, and I, I want to, to ask you for uh, a small time saying this because it's a very important thing. Um, my friendship with Acris changed my life. Mm -hmm. um, changed my life as a person and also as, um, as a professional scientist. As a person, because I have learned that you don't need to have um, formal certification to be a scientist. So uh, you have my sincere admiration and respect. And what I want to say is um, after meeting people from the hobby, I started to use photographs in life in my articles. I started to, to go deeper. So um, this is really important to say. Uh, and I am pretty sure most of my colleagues also want this kind of opportunity too, because you have uh, very important and rare knowledge. And we can, both sides can benefit from this, from this relation. So uh, this is not something I'm saying just to be cool, but this is really truth. You can see uh, I published uh, my first article uh, with only photographs of dead fish and drawings. And after that, you can see that uh, things really changed after. I think this is uh, really important. Uh, it, and this is a message specifically for the Kivit fishing guys. Uh, you can really help, uh, but you need to remember that there is a better way to help and there is a legal way to help, which is getting in contact with uh, scientific groups working with, with this uh, specific group. Well, there you have it, my friends. That's part two, the Brazilian perspective. 
I, you know, as you can see, I hopefully you've made it this far. I apologize the video being so long. Honestly, me and Luis talked for over an hour and 45 minutes, so trimming it down was even more challenging than you can imagine. But the, he had so much information, and so he's so passionate. There were so many things I felt we really, really needed to leave in and have that discussion. But as you can see, the discussion has just started. We all need to come together, aquarist, scientists, the global community. If you're passionate about fish, you should be passionate about this topic. So as always, my friends, thank you for watching. Until next time, stay safe.